A couple of things from last week. Somebody asked me what the vitamin C content was in a manzanita berry. Was that you? So 100 grams of manzanita is 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C. That's really high. So get your manzanita berries and you save on vitamins. And someone asked me how long a millipede lives. And I guess but um, I found this really cool thing that we'll have during our insect class, millipedes versus centipedes. And um, millipedes live one to 10 years and they become sexually mature in two to three years. So it's a good potential pet. <laughs> Today we're going to um, be in the classroom with David Herlocker for about an hour. And then we'll be in the field after that. And everybody should have a red dot or a green dot. And the people who have a red dot are H1s. That's Herlocker 1s. And so you'll be with David Herlocker first. And then we'll all meet together at lunchtime. And then the H2s will be with David Herlocker second. Without further ado, are you ready? Um, David Herlocker is a naturalist for the for Marin County, actually. Marin County is a county that has professional naturalists on staff, and that's their job and their county employees. And Dave's, the, Dave's an award-winning field naturalist. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mrs. Terwilliger, but the Terwilligers give out an award annually, and Dave is the recipient of the Terwilliger Award from 2016. Um, he's an extraordinary field naturalist, and he's got a special affinity for reptiles and amphibians, so you'll fall in love with him today, but don't be sad at the end of the day, because he's going to come back for the amphibians class, too. So know that if he leaves you wanting more of him, you're going to get more of him. And um, thank you so much for being here today, and you don't want to. Give me the microphone. Um, so please let me know if that's not the case. And one thing that I do have a tendency to do is talk to the screen. I'll do my best not to do that today, but it's, I'm just going to confess it, it's a bad habit. Um, very quickly, yes, I'm a naturalist in Green County. Um, I lead two walks a week, uh, one on Sunday, one during the week. And they're free and worth every penny. <laughs> Second thing I want to mention is, after doing this job for 10 plus years, um, there are now two naturalists. And the second naturalist actually came out of this room right here. I did a, a dance docent training in 2000, whatever, I don't know. And uh, one of the docents started coming on my walks, and I realized that she knew a lot about everything. So Shannon Berg, former Bouvry docent, is now the, the second interpretive naturalist for Marie County Parks. So if you have some free time, check out Marie County Park website and come on a walk or two. And uh, yeah, if you, you'll enjoy it. Um, I am going to try very, very hard. To get, it is now 9.05. I have used one minute. So at 10.04, I'm done. Okay? And this is a dose of training class. I know there's a lot of mentors here. And so I'm really going to try to focus on the things that I think are important to 9 to 10 year olds. You're in third and fourth graders, right? Um, and just so that I can get through this, uh, I have a tendency to go off on tangents. I'm going to try to do this, right? Um, just so I can get through this, we'll make it not quite as interactive as I sometimes get. Um, if you have questions, um, we, maybe we can talk about those on the trail. Um, I occasionally misspeak. Uh, so if you know that I mean to be saying gopher snake and I'm saying king snake, let me know that stuff, okay? Otherwise, thank you for being here. Kudos to all of you for being volunteers. Someday I'm going to actually volunteer my time, but you know, my hat's off to you today. Okay, so. Reptiles of the preserve. Um, I'm starting off with pretty much the commonest things. Kind of strange that the rattlesnake is right there, but I see the genie put together a little guide to the uh, common snakes and lizards of the preserve. And the first animal is the rattlesnake. And kind of interesting, I have probably seen more rattlesnakes than I have seen more rattlesnakes here than any other snake. So kind of good to know about them. We'll talk a little bit about them today. But we'll try to talk about everything 
and work with my team and touch on the touch on the key concepts that you're supposed to know. Um, but first of all, I wanted to say, um, you've all had library time. I saw some of these books over there. Um, really important to just say, Robert Stebbins from UC Berkeley. He passed away a few years back. We are very lucky to have had him in the Bay Area. Um, he published field guides. Um, uh, just prior to him passing, he and Sam McGinnis, another great herpetologist, put together Amphibious Reptiles of California, which is a, a much better book in terms of a little more natural history data on the animals. So it's not just a field guide, it's better. But I also want to point out a book that is no longer in print, but still available occasionally on Amazon. This one I've had so long, I just love this. This is, this is the first thing I bought when I moved to Oakland, California. Um, Reptiles and Amphibious just in the Bay Area. And it covers everything we talked about today. It fits in your pocket. And so this is a great book to have. And it kind of speaks to a, a, a little bit more of a, shall we say, it's, it's, it's a little more geared towards kids. So if, think in the mind of an eight-year-old, read that book, and you'll need to get better with like nine and 10-year-olds, OK? Um, the other thing I really want to emphasize is if you're interested in this topic, there's actually a website that doesn't have a bunch of misinformation. Okay? The, the internet is, is a quagmire, a minefield of bad information. It's getting better, but Gary Davis has put together a California Reptile Defendant's website, easy to navigate, extremely informative, and absolutely accurate. He really does a good job of keeping up with things. So remember this one. Any question you have, you can pretty much get the answer on this website. Okay, so reptiles. What are reptiles? Um, contrary to the fact that we think that they're sort of dinosaurs, uh, uh, reptiles basically are like dinosaurs in some ways. The only leftover dinosaurs we have are, or archosaurs, they the crocodiles and birds are much more closely related to them. Nonetheless, they have a few things in common. Reptiles have scaly skin. Now, birds have scales in their legs, but you know, reptiles have scaly skin, as opposed to amphibians. You know, a lizard is just a, a, a salamander with scales. Okay, so. There are some reptiles that are live bearers and some that are egg laying, and we'll get into that with each species and why those different traits occur within the reptile, reptiles. Um, they're all air breathing. There are no fully aquatic reptiles. But, um, there are a couple of fully aquatic reptiles, but they do have to come to the surface and breathe. Um, they are cold blooded. I'll go into that a little bit more. Cold blooded doesn't mean that they're running around, you know, icy temperatures. Um, it's just they're physiologically adapted to. Uh, uh, getting their heat from the environment. Um, the term brumation, uh, a lot of reptiles have periods when they're inactive. Here, it's usually during the cold, wet season, and they don't hibernate. They do what we call brumate. A couple of monochords will show in here. I like words. And, uh, and remember, the lizards and snakes, I'll talk to, touch about this, upon this a little bit more later, are actually in the same group. They're not that much different from one another. Um, they basically are squamates if you're looking at the classification of reptiles. Um, so, we'll start with the most common thing. The thing that you might see here, um, five feet out the door on the average sunny day, um, are western fence lizards, okay? So, as it says right there, common in virtually all habitats. Even in the deep woods, you can often find them. But, they more often are, are available in sunny habitats where they can bask on rocks and logs. And this is the time of year when at least the first person on the trail will see the babies dashing off into the cracks. So the baby's habitat is usually clear, open areas. They can't get up on a rock or a log because there's big fence lizards up there that will chase them off. And they're much more vulnerable to predation. Okay, so this is the time of year when the young of the year are basically usually in the trail, that goes in the clearings through our grasslands, and you see them dashing off all the time. And because I'm pretty sure we're going to catch a few fence lizards, or let's just say we're going to catch some fence um, we'll talk a lot more in detail about them when we get out there in the field and have the subject in our hand. Um, one thing that I'm is, they're easy to observe, but easy to observe primarily because they have to bask. They, um, they are one of the reptiles that they're cold-blooded, but they really get their heat by getting up and exposing themselves to the rays of the sun, to ultraviolet radiation. And uh, so it, it makes them something that you can almost always see because they have to be out in the open in order to get their, their blood going. Um, 
I'm going to talk about noosing. Um, some of you may really want to actually catch a lizard and show it to the kids. One of the most important things about using a noose, it's a little slip nut that we use dental floss, and I'll show it to you. I know Richard has a noose too. Um, noosing isn't just the best way to catch lizards, it's the best way to catch lizards without hurting them. So that's a really important thing. That's the most important thing we can do. One of the reasons that 9 and 10 year olds and 5 year olds and, and you know, 7 year olds um, are interested in reptiles, I think, is because we can hold them in our hand and they have eyes and they have skeletons. They're, they're, they're just like us. They are. They're vertebrates, very, very much like us um, physiologically, but we can hold them in our hand. They're not a bird that flies by or a mammal that skitters away. So there's really something intimate about sharing reptiles with people. There's, Excuse me. There's nothing like, you know, a kid touching a lizard for the first time and, oh, just the, the chill that goes over both of you when that happens. So experience that. Um, now, there's a word down here called autospicy. And I put that down there because for the longest time, I'm in the process of correcting all that misinformation I've given for the past 40 year career. Um, I used to use the term autotomy for the ability of these animals to shed part or all of their tails when they're captured. That's one of the reasons that we noose them. We do not want them to lose their tail. And I, I really recently was told um, by Shannon Burke that she looked it up and she found out that autotomy is actually, autotomy is actually when an animal can basically cast off a body part. And there's a debate that I got into with some herpetologists and other people about whether a lizard can, can throw its tail or lose its tail. And none of the lizards we have here can. They all have to basically be somehow restrained. You have to basically put some pressure on the tail. The animal then shakes its pelvis or shakes its tail. And you end up with a piece of tail that's wiggling and the lizard gets away. So that's actually um, autospicy, which is the, uh, the new word that I just learned. And then, um, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's really important to, uh, to know that these animals um, to have this, you know, predator escape mechanism. So here they are, they're out in the open, they're exposed to predators during the daytime, but if they're a half a step faster than the skunk or whatever that's going to try to catch them, that animal gets the tail, the tail bounces and wiggles and runs, and, you know, the, the lizard runs off and gets one more chance. But what I always tell the kids, oh, oh I'm going to talk to you like you're much kids, that's okay, is, the tail is an important storage organ for fats and for proteins, okay? It gets them through the hard times. And so, even though the lizards can grow their tail back, and a lot of technologists will tell you that, that that's why it's okay, um, it's basically like you're stealing all the food that they have, all the food that they store, and now they have to go back to the store, they might not have money, or however you want to put it. But let, let them know that it is not uh, harmless at all. It, it can cause a female not to reproduce during that year, and if it happens late enough in the season, the animal might not survive the long period when it's down underground, not hibernating, still burning up some energy. So it's really important to, to grind that in. A lot of your kids are going to try to catch lizards with their hands. It's just going to happen even if you tell them five seconds before. We, we know that about uh, nine-year-olds, I think mean, there's nine-year-olds. Um, so we'll go into the annual cycle of activities. And this is kind of important. I'll try to do this with almost all these animals because it, 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 it's important to sort of put the animal in the context of the, the time of the year. So what's happening right now? You know, what, why are the baby lizards on the trail right now? Um, so these animals are, you know, in these habitats, you can probably find fence lizards uh, out and active during January on sunny days. We do have sunny days in December and all those, you know, all those times of the year, but for the most part, they take the cold season off, they go underground, and they just basically um, slow down their metabolism a great deal and wait it out until they can sense that it is time to come to the surface and get life started. So when spring first arrives, which in the Bay Area is February usually, the males tend to come out a little bit sooner because the males have to be in condition to mate when the females come out. So the first ones you see are these, they're always kind of dirty because they've been underground during the rainy season and the, and the rain has washed silt and stuff down on them and then they evaporates and rains and evaporates. So they've always got this sort of film of dust on them early in the season. And then a couple weeks later you start noticing a lot of animals that have shed, especially the tops of their heads often shed first at that time, okay? So the females then come out and then it's time for everybody to sort of 
uh, find their rock or find their log. Usually it's the same rock or log that they were on last year, and then to find one another. Uh, very often these animals relate with the same other animal repeatedly because they tend to be relatively localized, um, but they don't like mate for life or anything. A male may have seven or eight female partners, and a female might have seven or eight male partners. It's, there's been a couple interesting studies on the, the fidelity of these animals, shall we say. Um, so they may, generally speaking, um, as soon as they're physiologically capable, usually in mid-spring, mid which around here is like you know late March, early April, and by the end of May, the females have matured the eggs inside of their bodies, you know, six to 14 eggs, depending on how big the animal is. And then they, they find a place, uh, usually at the edge of the woods or at the edge of a, of a wet spot, where there's decomposing vegetation, they make a little, they scrape out a little spot, and they deposit their eggs. And one really cool thing about reptile eggs, as opposed to bird eggs, is reptile eggs are not hard. Reptile eggs are leathery, soft, and kind of rubbery. And what's really cool about that is we have this little tiny lizard, and it's going to lay, let's just say the average lizard lays eight eggs. And you hold this animal up, and you think, where do those eight eggs fit? They're about the size of a single peanut, you know, after you've cracked it open and held it up, it's just a you know, five millimeters long. Anyway, but what's really cool about that leathery shell is the eggs can expand. So as soon as the egg is laid in this soil that has a slight amount of moisture in it, it can actually bring moisture into the egg and expand in size to a third again bigger than it was when it was crowded inside a mom. Mm -hmm. And just before the eggs hatch, they actually tend to, to swell again. So eggs that grow, eggs are alive, eggs are breathing, okay? Even the hard eggs that we eat for breakfast are, are permeable to oxygen and that allows that little chick inside there to grow. Um, so the eggs stay underground depending on where latitude, altitude, but here they probably start to emerge the end of June, the first part of July, and then it's just baby lizard season. You keep seeing baby lizards, we call young of the year, um, throughout the warm part of the summer and on into you know, our summer usually lasts until the first range, which might happen in October. The weather stays pretty nice. Every now and then, fence lizards will do what we call double clutching. You know, they don't drive diesel trucks. Um, <laughs> if, if, situation is, if the situations are right, uh, and spring is, we have an early, relatively early spring, and there's plenty of bugs around, a female will produce a second clutch of eggs later in the season. So you might start seeing more really small baby lizards again. But generally speaking, those little lizards just do anything they can to survive, and uh, then they too take the winter off. They very seldom are seen out in the winter. Their body mass isn't, isn't enough to let them come out. Then they come out the following spring, and uh, <coughs> with luck, they survive the year, and by their second year, they're sexual. They can be sexually mature, but generally it takes three years for them to be adults and to be able to, to mate and stuff like that. And again, I will go into a lot more when we're outside. We will see fence lizards today, but it's kind of starting to come out. Um, so kind of some of the important stuff. So sexual dimorphism, not quite as important to, to fourth, third and fourth graders as it might be, but um, it's kind of interesting that everybody calls these blue bellies. And it's okay to call them blue bellies because we're just trying to communicate it's like ladybug versus ladybird beetle. This lizard does have a blue belly, but it is important to say this lizard is a western fence lizard. It's one of the blue-bellied lizards. There are over 40 blue-bellied lizards in western North America alone, lizards that have blue bellies. Not all of them are closely related to this one. So anyway, just try to get the blue belly thing into their mind so they can teach their dad that he was wrong all the time. <laughs> Generally speaking, males have more pigment than, uh, than females. So over here, this is, this is our male. Um, he's got a lot of really nice, well-developed pigment. Um, and here's a female, she has blue in her throat, she has blue on the sides, but she doesn't have any of this orange pigmentation in her femoral area or in, on the backs of her legs. Um, so if you want to tell the boys from the girls, you can tell it from the moment they're born. A male has, but you can't really see them, there's two enlarged scales right there. And males always have those. But when males get into breeding condition, they also get this very swollen area behind the tail. And that's where, see this word hemipenes? Uh, lizards and snakes both have two phalluses, two, and called hemipenes because they're not true penises. Anyway, this isn't nine-year-old stuff in books. <laughs> anyway, you know, they're, they're ready, they're basically ready whichever side they end up on. Um, but the, 
the MPAs don't develop and the sperm don't develop until the animal has basically warmed up and had enough to eat. So every year they go through the cycle of being basically infertile to being in prime condition. So they get this, this swollen area behind the tail. But females don't change all that much. They just tend to get more and more rotund until they lay eggs. That's, that's their grab. Um, and it says here, femoral pores. This is kind of a cool thing when you have the lizard in your hand. So here on the, on the femur, on the femoral area of the male, you can see this row of scales right here. And if you look closely at it, there are little circles, and some of them are more extruded than others. And you can take your fingers, and you can kind of just rub off a little bit of dust off of each one of those. So femoral pores are actually basically like crayons that are being slowly pushed out of the laser lizard, and everywhere he goes, they're scraping his scent on his area. And lizards, sense lizards tend to be very, very uh, site-specific. A lizard will usually be in the same group of rocks or logs in the same area for the entire season. So he's basically tagging that area. And one thing that you can observe um, when you're watching these animals is there's a lot of tongue flicking going on. Some of that is eating, they're often eating insects that are smaller than we can see, but a lot of that is that's how they basically tell who's in the area. A male will test the area to see if there's females around, and a lizard exploring new places will want to know if there's big males around. And it's a lot easier to find out by smelling them uh, before you run into them and they chase you off or bite you. Um, so that covers the basic stuff that I wanted to talk about in terms of the boys versus the girls. Um, one thing I will say about pigmentation is why does this animal have uh, a completely camouflaged dorsal surface and have all this bright color underneath, okay? So another thing, this is something we can observe when we see one, we stop the kids, we get down low, is when they see us or when they see another lizard, they often do push-ups. And if you have an Indian and you want to, you can sometimes do push-ups again to do push-ups back at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Like, the, kids, the kids remember that. So the idea is this animal wants to be camouflaged because there are a lot of visually oriented predators, kestrels and stuff like that that are out in the daytime looking for them um, and some snakes and lizards. But when it's time to either get the attention of a female, which is something that males like to do, or get the attention of a male coming into your territory and say, look dude, you can't be coming up here, you flash. You basically flash these colors, he pushes his dewlap down, arches his back, and it's basically a flashing signal to uh, those are do see blue in the blue spectrum that says either it says I'm fit. It tells the female I am a worthy mate, and the eggs that you lay if you mate with me will be worthy individuals. And it says to another male, it says I'm fit. It says I'll whoop you if you come up on my line. <laughs> and you say it like that. I mean, you say it whatever language you want, but um, they remember that. The kids remember that. Yes. <laughs> Jeannie likes to refer to the little western fence lizards as nature's french fries. Will you talk about that? Well, where she puts that. These are sort of the, when you, when you start looking at the prey of, of almost everything, uh, both diurnal and nocturnal animals, um, if, there's a, if western fence lizards or lizards of this size occur, they're on the list. And they're at the top of the list for a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, let's just say we're a, we're a kestrel or another small raptor, um, not just the little ones. Western fence lizards, um, let's say the little ones are a french fry, and, and the adults might be a, a cheeseburger, and if you can catch a bowl, that's like, that's like you know, a whole prime rib all to yourself. <laughs> but there's an awful lot of these little snacks out there in the world, and these guys have to live their lives. Basically, um, they're predators themselves. They're feeding on insects that are pretty easy to catch it. They're not looking out. They just aren't that much smart up here. Um, but there's an awful lot of things that are threats to the lizards. Thank you for reminding me of that one. That's in the list there. Um, this is an important and fun thing to do. So in the morning, generally speaking in the morning, we have clouds and stuff. When you see the fence lizards, they tend to be a lot darker. Oh, my light's not keeping in. So they tend to be a lot darker. And then you can walk by the same log and see a lizard on that same log that looks like this. And it's very, very often the same lizard. So remember we talked about cold bloodedness. So these animals are called heliotherms. They get their heat from the sun directly. And they basically have to get their body temperature up at about the same temperature as ours 
you know, high 80s into high 90s in order for them to be able to function properly. So they're not cold-blooded at all. Um, but they don't want to get too hot because there's a thermal maximum that's right around 103. And sitting in the full sun in Sonoma County, you can get up to 103 pretty quick, and that can be fatal for them. So they have this feedback mechanism. On the top of their head, they have what's called a third eye, a pineal eye. And it basically, they can't really see out of it, but it's structured like an eye. And it basically tells them when they've had too much sun. So what that does is it triggers, it physiologically triggers them to pull the, the dark stuff, the melanin, out of the tissue over their scales, out of their skin, and basically they become lighter. So they absorb less light, and they actually reflect more light. So it's a way that they can keep themselves not getting too cool, but not getting too hot either. And that brings up another important thing. <coughs> That's why I don't use a microphone. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not contagious. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, too light, too dark. Uh oh. Um, oh, the, the cock's coming off there. Oh, oh, the very important thing is so here we have this thing, whoever gave that to me. Um, these animals have these rough scales of the these animals have these rough scales, and when I'm holding the animal, I often let the kids pet it one way and pet it the other. And it's hard to believe that there's a living skin over the scales, okay? They all have it. And so that is the skin, that very thin tissue layer, is where these pigments are going to and from as this animal is trying to get its temperature just right. Um, and when we find a fence lizard that is shedding, we can sort of make that point to them. And you very seldom find fence lizard skins. We find alligator lizard skins and snake skins a lot. The fence lizards tend to shed in little scraps a little bit at a time. So you very, very seldom encounter them out there in the field. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll get so very quickly, I wanted to talk about uh, ticks and Lyme disease. Uh, we, it's really good to know about Lyme disease. I won't go into it a great deal. But uh, 20 or so years ago, researchers at UC Berkeley discovered that fence lizards and southern alligator lizards have a protein in their blood that neutralizes Lyme disease. So the ticks are born and they come out as a larva. And they, generally speaking, there's new information about this, they usually don't carry the disease out of the egg. They have to take a blood meal from a host that is carrying that bacteria. They drop off of that host, shed their skin, then find a new host. And so ticks around here are very fond of western fence lizards and alligator lizards. Um, and if the tick is infected as a larva and takes its next blood meal as a nymph, then it is going to uh, basically be vaccinated and cured against Lyme disease and can't pass it on. And that's what's considered to be one of the reasons that our Lyme disease rates are considerably lower here than in the rest of North America, particularly the, some of the Great Lakes states and in northern New England, where rates can be over 50% 50 50 of the ticks that you catch are carriers, are infected. But this is kind of interesting. A recent study was done where um, they removed uh, they removed as many fences as possible. They tried to remove all the fences from plots. And they were going to see if, what we expected to happen, that the, the Lyme disease the incidence of Lyme disease would go up in the tick population because we didn't have these vaccinators out there in the population. But that's not what happened. It turns out that the tick population ex the, oh, excuse me, the tick population basically went down to almost nothing. That's how important these lizards are to the life cycle of these ticks. So it's probably still important for these lizards to be out there and to be sort of controlling Lyme disease, but it's it, it's it's just a little bit more difficult to to say that, you know, every cat that kills a lizard is, is making Lyme disease more prevalent in your backyard because it actually depresses the tick. <coughs> so this is one of the things I'm correcting as I go through the end of my career. Um, if you want to know more about this, if it interests you, just Google uh, uh, Robert Lane, UC Berkeley. He's retired, but you get all the people working in his lab, and you get the paper that I just described, and all kinds of other good stuff about ticks and wild turkeys and Lyme disease and Anyway, it's a fascinating topic, and one, yes? What type of host does the tick get Lyme disease The tick can get Lyme disease from, usually their first host, uh, around here, the, the 
the heaviest vector of Lyme disease are western gray squirrels, followed very closely by wood rats. Those are two animals we have in this habitat. Jackrabbits are big time carriers, but they can get it from birds as well. They can get it from almost any animal or any bird. But deer mice, gophers, and those two rodents that I mentioned. You did bugs already, right? Yeah. You're first. Oh, okay. Um, yes, another question. Can, can you just mention his name again? Robert, Robert Lane, UC Berkeley. Okay, and here, here is the, the other hero, um, the southern alligator lizard. Very often when you find them, you'll find that they have uh, a, a good amount of ticks, usually behind their head. Um, you notice in the fence that they're usually in the fold of the ear. That's because a tick can't really get into the skin between those big heavy scales, but behind the ear and in the soft skin around the legs they can get in. And alligator lizards are very heavily armored, and there's one area behind the head, but more often there's a fold right here along the body between the hard upper scales and the hard lower scales where the ticks can get, you know, get their mouth parts into them. Well, it's kind of cool when you catch when you catch a, uh, uh, an alligator lizard is you can let the kids feel how hard it is on the top and how hard it is on the bottom and say, but how does it, you know, how does it breathe? And if you hold it for a minute, you can see that those, those granular scales along the side or it allows it to expand and contract as it breathes. You can watch the animal breathe in your hand. Yes? It's a quick question. If you have the kids handling these things, do we have to take extra precaution for them getting a tick on them? No. If the tick is on the lizard, it's... So if you're not to be, if, if you're anywhere you are, you have to be careful about picking up ticks. This, this is a, this, all the habitat around here is really good tick habitat. So I'll, I won't go into that right now. I'm not sure when you all will go into that, but it's an important thing to go into. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to try to get through this. <laughs> anyway, and it's not as important. Here I have the the characteristics to tell a northern alligator lizard from a southern alligator lizard. But we'll go into cooler habitats versus warmer, drier habitats. Generally speaking, northern alligator lizards are found in the cooler habitats, you know, the edge of the Negospur and the oak forest. And the southern alligator lizards are more in the open, uh, the oak savanna and the grassland areas. And what's kind of interesting about these two is that even though they're closely related, this animal is a live bearer and this animal is an egg layer. So very briefly, I'm going to try to tell you the difference. One of the key concepts is oviparous versus viviparous, I think. At least I think it is. Um, and why do some reptiles uh, have their young live and some reptiles lay eggs? Well, as it turns out, if, if a reptile, if the southern alligator lizard um, finds a place where she lays her eggs, she basically is going to leave her eggs. We are now at the mercy of the temperature where they were laid, right? Um, on the average, the temperature is going to be probably because she's a good mom, she laid her eggs in the right place. But if you're living in a cooler habitat, the possibility for those eggs to mature at a, rel at a relatively reasonable rate and to hatch is dependent on their temperature. So if the eggs are retained inside of the female for longer, she's moving about and keeping her body temperature relatively high. And so she is basically keeping those eggs from getting too cool and maturing too slowly. So she is, still has basically eggs that are unshelled inside of her, and then when they're fully mature, she gives live birth to young. Okay? Um, so that's what she's ovoviviparous. Okay, viviparous is there's a placental connection between the mother and the young. Ovoviviparous is a, um, a term for the live bearing. And then the southern alligator lizard, as it says here, is the egg lay. Uh, member of this group. Um, yeah, we won't go too much into identifying them. It's not as important. It's not as important to identify every animal you see as to be able to talk about why it's there and when it's there. Um, so this is an animal that is actually probably really common here, but you don't see them very often. When you do see them, all you see is a vanishing blue tail. <laughs> and, and almost all the time, if you're with someone who isn't familiar with the species, it's like, snake, blue snake, snake. Because they move very snake-like, and all your eye sees is the blue. And that's the point. Why does this animal have this bright blue tail? Um, they are basically also prey items for a lot of animals, and that animal will 
obviously see the blue more than the lizard, and very often will get the tail. And these animals are very, very delicate. I should have mentioned this to the alligator lizard. I talked about losing tails. Um, I have a personal rule about skinks of all kinds. If you turn over a log and there's a skink there and it's sitting still, it's okay to, to relatively gently to capture it. Don't, don't put your hand on its tail. If it's moving, leave it. Just let it go because you might think you've got a fast hand, but you know, I've accidentally taken the tails off of alligator lizards and skinks. The same rule applies to alligator lizards, which are more common here or a little more often seen. Um, if it's sitting still, that means that it's probably still pretty cool, and if you have a reasonable angle on it, you can, you can pick it up. And we'll, we'll hopefully talk about and demonstrate handling animals like this. It doesn't always happen, but if it's moving, let it go. And hopefully you'll be the one in charge and the kids uh, won't make that decision. What's also kind of interesting is this is an adult. This is a, the same species. This is the Western skink um, as a full adult. So as they age, the blue in the tail sort of vanishes. And so, and, oh, this is a male. You can see a little orange on his face. And this is a big adult male. And the females don't get that orange on their face. Um, anyway, so why, if this blue tail is such an advantage, do they lose that when they're mature? Well, the idea is, and this is something that's very hard to test, is that once the animal becomes mature, it doesn't have to spend quite as much time out in the open. It's found a place where it can be relatively protected. Um, they might be able to get a lot of their uh, heat requirement without being out in the full sun. And so not being seen is more important than being seen and giving up your tail for the fact that whatever saw you as a predator. Um, so that's, that's still the current theory. And what's also kind of cool, we don't see this in a lot of reptiles, is maternal care. So at about like the end of May, around here, you stop seeing the female skinks because the females go lay their eggs, usually underground, and stay with them. And the idea is they, they keep them moist by, this is a fourth grade term, by micturating upon them. They basically, reptiles don't urinate, but they release moisture from their cloaca, and they've also, in captivity, been known to lick their eggs. But basically, they stay with the eggs until they mature. And then all of a sudden you start seeing female lizards that are rapidly hungry, they're all moving about quite a lot, and you start seeing the baby skates. A baby skate is, you know, reptiles don't tend to be cute, but a baby skate is memorably gorgeously cute. <laughs> 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 if you're lucky enough for it to be cold and you can catch them in So, so boom, that's the cast of characters of lizards that we have here. And again, we're going to really get some of these when we get into the field. Um, so then we'll move into the snakes. But very quickly, as I said at the beginning, <coughs> lizards and snakes are really very, very similar. Um, but you can't quite say that you know, a lizard is, uh, a snake is just a lizard with no legs. Um, because there are plenty of lizards with no legs. Um, there are a number of groups of lizards that have uh, evolved into leglessness. So we'll start, for example, with our, our friends, the alligator lizards. Um, when you see them moving, they're very snake-like. They have very long tails, which actually uh, it tends to slither in a snake-like fashion. And they do even pull their hind legs in sometimes and just pull this with their front legs. Um, so legs are somewhat of an impediment if you're moving through leaves and under roots and stuff like that. And so the more, the term is fossorial, the more your life depends on being just below the surface of the ground, the less you need egg, the, the less you need legs. And so evolution has sort of driven the, uh, uh, the loss of legs. So here's an alligator lizard, and here's this is a glass lizard from Eastern North America. And you can see it really is an alligator lizard, but it just doesn't have any legs at all. And just like the alligator lizard, this animal has a tail that starts right about here, and it can break off really easily. So you see, you know, I don't live where there are glass lizards, but I've seen glass lizards that are just a head and a blunt end that lost their entire tail. Um, so a number of members of that family are legless. Um, and then the skinks, the, the group that has led to the most legless, um, legless lizards are the skinks. Um, this is a snake-eyed skink. Um, and this is another, this is a, a tropical skink. They look very, very snake-like. The primary difference is, um, we don't have legless lizards here, but um, snakes don't have a movable eyelid, and snakes don't have external ears. And lizards, even the legless lizards, do. Okay? 
And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the snakes here. But I have this picture up here. So it's believed that this is a bloody and earless monitor. This is the, the fossil records, at least what I was indicating, seem to indicate that the, this type of monitor basically gave rise to the, the legless group that we now know as snakes. I'll put a big asterisk on that. There's a lot of people who think that, the, that snakes may have evolved out of different groups of lizards at different times. So there's an advantage to being legless if that aids you in um, catching prey and staying alive long enough to lay eggs and have babies. Um, so very quickly, a typical non-venomous snake. Um, probably the commonest non-venomous snake here would be the, I think it's the second one on Jimmy's list here. So this is a picture of the gopher snake. Um, and if you look over to the right, there's the snake's skull. And one of the things that I learned when I was a kid is that snakes can unhinge their jaws, and that's what allows them to eat really big food. And that really isn't true. So what I like to do is, so do you see the skull and the, the mandibles themselves right down here? Well, my mandibles, here's, here's the snake skull, right? My mandibles are fused like this. So I can, I can always follow something that can fit into this space right here, right? And I can get into my mouth and down my throat, all right? But if my mandibles are like this, I could take something much bigger. And in fact, the, man, the mandibles on the bones that they're attached can swing out and basically engulf greatly large, really large prey. And another really cool thing is the bones in the skull are not, our skull is not a bone, it's a series of bones with, we have rigid fusion lines between the bones. Snakes don't, snakes have a bendable skull. So the head can actually change shape to accommodate, this is a gopher snake, eating, I think this is a gopher, um, this is the ventral side of a gopher, which was five, six times wider than, than the size of that snake's mouth and head. But basically what happens is they catch their prey, they throw their body around it and constrict it. I'll talk about that in a second. And then they are able to pretty much walk those lower jaws. See how the teeth aim backwards and the front teeth, the top teeth aim backwards? They basically are able to sort of walk those lower jaws independently and pull the prey into their body. And then what happens is the muscles in the front of their body basically squeeze, like if you want to empty a tube of toothpaste, you kind of do like that stuff right there. So it's sort of a peristaltic wave that pulls the prey in at that point. So that's how the typical non-venomous snake feeds. And just a cool aside, why don't they suffocate when they're eating something so big that it takes them 15 minutes to swallow it? It's because their trachea actually comes out underneath their tongue, really close to the front of their mouth. And sometimes when you watch a snake eat really large prey, you can see the trachea extend out of the snake's mouth. And you can actually see it breathing. Um, anyway, good luck to you in that field. Um, I shouldn't have said that, but it's just a cool fact. So, I will talk more about, about gopher snakes. Uh, um, well, I'll talk, I'll talk, actually, let me just go back. I'm not going to do this. So, constriction. So, we have some snakes that, that kill by constriction. Um, I'll talk about each one. Gopher snakes probably be the commonest one that we see that does this. So, constrictors are non venomous. They grab their prey and they very quickly wrap a couple of coils of their body around it and they begin squeezing it. And they're not crushing their prey, and they're not suffocating their prey. And for many, many years, the theory that I was taught was, what happens is the snake is around this little mouse, and now the animal is being held so tight that the diaphragm can no longer, we don't realize it, but we breathe by it. There's a muscular action that makes, makes our lung cavity enlarge, air comes in, and then pushes the air out. But once the snake is wrapped around the, the prey item, the diaphragm can't move. And that's true to a certain point, but we've now learned that it actually, the pressure of the snake basically gives the animal, puts so much pressure on the animal that it stops the heart from being able to pump the blood. And the animal, the animal faints, but not from lack of oxygen based on the lungs not working, it's from lack of oxygen based on the fact that the lung, it, the blood is not moving at all. So new stuff, and again, I've got to tell that to everybody that I've missed the for all these years. <laughs> you can tell I've been lying in the world for, for, as, for a living that long time. Um, but anyway, they don't crush their prey and they don't choke them to death. It's even more fun than that. <laughs> as, opposed, as opposed to garter snakes. So garter snakes, I don't, 
there, there's a number of different garter snakes. We won't get into ID really, but really quickly. Uh, there are three different species of garter snake in this area. The western aquatic garter snake, which, as the name implies, tends to be found in aquatic habitats. Probably your most common one, I'm not sure. The western terrestrial garter snake, these are different species. And then the common garter snake, I'm showing here two different looks, two different subspecies that are found um, in our area. But generally speaking, what you can see right there is that they, they have kind of a general look. They are basically have a dark background and they have a, a, a mid-dorsal stripe. And I'm going to skip down to camouflage down here. So one cool thing, if you have a garter snake or if you see a garter snake and it's at the end of the creek or whatever, at Cougar Pond, well, then they probably come in to feed on the tree frogs that are there, is it doesn't look like a really good camouflage, does it? It almost looks like it's like calling attention to itself. But in the world where they live, there are an awful lot of squiggly lines. There's like dark stuff and squiggly lines. And if you see a snake at the edge of a pond, very often you'll realize what effective camouflage that actually is against things like great blue herons and, and uh, red-tailed, red-shouldered hawks and things that feed on these guys. Um, they're pretty hard to see. So they're, I did, almost all the garter snakes and their relatives tend to be aquatic and adapted. Uh, they're found in and around water courses. Um, there are some that feed almost exclusively on amphibians, some feed exclusively on fish. Ours are a little more general than that, but most of them feed on the, sort of the French fry of the, of the amphibian world is the, the tree frog. Everyone eats tree frogs. Um, one really cool thing about garter snakes, uh, which is also a good thing for nyantinians, is they have musk glands. Um, so a lot of bugs do this. There's a lot of millipedes do this. Um, it would really be good for when a predator catches you, for you to be able to tell it that you don't taste good before it bites into you to find that. <laughs> so garter snakes and king snakes, I'll say that now, have musk glands. And when you catch a garter snake, what happens is it throws its tail up quite often because you're there onto you. But basically what it's trying to do is smear itself with musk so that you smell it. It's a very distinctive smell. And if you taste it, you might decide you don't want to eat that too. It's, very, it's a very effective defense. And garter snakes, I have heard, are uh, rejected by a lot of predators that eat snakes because they actually don't taste great. The musk is sort of the hint of that. But the musk is a powerful thing. But what's kind of cool with kids is, um, are snakes slimy? No, they're reptiles. They're, they're not slimy, they have dry skin. <laughs> this snake is slimy. You know, a lot of people who've experienced snakes, the first snake they found has been a king snake or a green neck or, or a garter snake. They're slimy. Okay, so it's, it's just sort of a, 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 a myth that isn't and you can sort of talk about why people might have had the belief that snakes are slimy creatures. Um, the other cool thing is if you see a garter snake or catch a garter snake, look at that beautiful tongue. All garter snakes have a, a, a red, dark red tongue with a black tip to it. And why? Um, well, they don't all do this, but there's actually been a couple studies done where the snakes have been seen sitting by the edge of the water using their tongue just at the top of the water, and fish tend to see things like that and come up and check it out and that's when the snake catches them. So it's actually a ton of movement mechanism. Um, and prey capture, I do want to talk about that. So feeding on amphibians, so these aren't constrictors. So a garter snake catches something as big as a foothill doll like a frog or something like that, a great big prey item, and it doesn't constrict it. It basically holds onto it, holds onto it relatively tightly, and little by little the frog kind of st stops struggling. So what's happening there is the teeth of the uh, of this garter snake have penetrated the very, very vascularized skin of that amphibian, and the saliva is now getting into those puncture wounds. And the saliva is somewhat toxic, okay? And that toxicity basically subdues this frog to the point where the garter snake can now, like the others, walk its jaws up it, pull it in, and then the snake basically dies from being constricted, you know, constricted inside of the snake for too long. But I'll just throw it on the side here if you want to look into this. Um, virtually all reptiles, um, almost all reptiles, have enzymes and proteins in their saliva that are the same things that are the venom of the cobra and the rattlesnake and all that. It just depends on how much they have, the concentration of it, and the delivery mechanism. And even the western fence lizard has toxic enzymes in its saliva, okay? But that doesn't mean 
You shouldn't worry about getting bitten. You don't have anything but the rattlesnake that we need to worry about the enzymes in their saliva. Um, so the rest of that stuff is not important. Let's get to this guy here. So I kind of already talked a little bit about constriction with these guys. So gopher snakes, um, their feeding habits are basically when they're young, they really do tend to specialize in lizards around here. Again, it's that fence lizard. Um, but they, uh, as all these reptiles do, they emerge when the weather starts to get a little bit warm. Um, they come out to the surface, and the first thing you want to do is, is get a couple of wheels in because you've been underground for about five months. And then basically breeding season starts. Um, you know, snakes are hard to find. Um, people don't want to go to certain places. Like, people don't want to go to Africa because there's all these poisonous snakes. I'm a snake hunter, and snakes are incredibly difficult to find. But that applies to snakes, too. It's very hard for, for an animal that isn't social, for an animal that disperses, for a male to locate a female. I mean, luckily, they can, they can taste the trail of the female and follow her around, even though she's a mile away already. But the reason I'm getting to this is, Mating doesn't have, have to happen every year for a female. Reptiles, generally speaking, and some of them have incredible honor in this, can store sperm. So the mating season happens when the males are out looking for the females, and mating may indeed happen. But if a female has mated once, she can store sperm in a, some of the side cavity of her oviduct, and she can fertilize eggs for years after that from that one, one dose of sperm that she's got. But generally speaking, the mating season, the males go out and try to find the females during early spring. Then the females go off and egg mature inside of them and go for snakes, like most of the other snakes are, um, are egg layers. And I skipped over something else, I'm trying to go so fast. Garter snakes are live bearers as well, okay? Um, anyway, I, I talked about oval viviparous and I forgot to... <coughs> um, so go for snakes for egg layers, um, and their activity schedule. So early in the season, we very often see them out in the daytime. And as the midday temperatures get to be, you know, too hot for them to be out crawling around. And remember, they're flat on the ground. So when the ground is hot, their bodies are hot, which is a good thing when it's uh, evening or when it's early in the season or just after rain. But it can be a really bad thing on a day when the temperature is 97 and above. So they tend to, to hide during the summer and come out more often uh, late in the afternoon and feed into the night. Um, so their activity schedule depends on the, the ambient temperatures. We start seeing the young of the year out, actually right about now, um, and they, because the temperatures have usually mellowed out a little bit more, we can often see uh, juvenile dryer snakes out during the daytime. Um, but one really cool thing about uh, about gopher snakes. I think I just said garter snakes. You guys missed that one. Um, really cool thing about, about gopher snakes is rattlesnake mimicry. And here in a place where there's a lot of rattlesnakes, this is a good thing to know. So very often when you encounter a gopher snake and it's a, a warmed up individual, it will rear back, it will actually flatten its head and have a very triangular head, it will hiss like crazy, and it will wiggle its tail really fast. Well, a rattle doesn't go ch -ch 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 like a rattle, it goes so that hiss and that tail wagging and that triangular head are very, very, very reminiscent of a rattlesnake. And if a young predator has survived a rattlesnake bite, which a lot of them do, um, this is probably sufficient for the, for the predator to leave it alone. Unfortunately, human beings, um, I've heard this story too many times in my career, um, killed a rattleless rattlesnake. Um, I used to do a presentation at Calvin Academy Sciences, and um, it was like, Quite often, I was told about rattlesnake rattlesnakes. Um, so it kind of backfires on them. But you can see there's quite a similarity between the, the rattlesnake and the gopher snake. Um, and very often, when you find them, you will get this act, or at least you'll get this shaking of the tail, which a lot of predators have learned to recognize as the behavior of something you don't want to mess with. Um, this is another snake that. Should be relatively common around here, the western yellow belly spacer. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, you can describe it as a greenish brown snake, uh, doesn't do it justice. This is the, the color of the iridescence, the texture of them. These are gorgeous animals. Um, and yes, it does have a, a pretty much a yellow belly. And just a side note for those of you that might be from elsewhere, this is a subspecies of the North American racer on the east coast of black, and they're called 
black racers. And in the center of the country, they tend to be bluish, and down into the southern states, they're called blue racers. And then here in the west, they're brown on top of the yellow belly. It's what they're called the western yellow belly racer. Same species, different adaptations, probably related to the habitats in which they're most successful. The substrate where they're trying to hide from predators and hide from prey. Racers are day active predators and they're very visually oriented predators. So you can often see a racer, if you're lucky to just see them moving along. Usually a racer is that thing that disappeared over there. They live up to their names. Their head is off the ground, they have really big eyes, and they're actually looking for usually lizards around here. They're, they're, they're big on feeding on Western fence lizards. Um, anyway, but what also is cool is the juveniles, this is a juvenile right here, it looks very much like a gopher snake. Or a rattlesnake, doesn't it? So there's probably some advantage to having this rattlesnake-like pattern when you're young before you're the fastest thing in the grass. Um, but how do you tell it from a gopher snake is, a gopher snake's pattern extends all the way down to the tail. You see how this tail basically fades to brown? This is a brand new animal. And as the animal matures, this color basically just moves up the body, and into the second year, they look pretty much like this. Gorgeous animals. If, if you get a chance to, to handle one of these guys, you're going to agree with me. Um, another very common snake around here, especially in the forest edge habitat, is the ring neck snake. Easy to see how it earns its name, but the ring around the neck. Um, this is also a snake with really powerful musk, um, and I've also been told that they are avoided by some snake predators that probably do taste bad. So, the, one of the first things that they do is they coil up their tail like this, and they sometimes, when they're harassed, will flip over and show their undersides. So basically, this is like being a yellow jacket. You're basically, this is the, the coloration that this animal is going to remember when it tastes that horrendous musk, or perhaps uh, not too good for the snake, it might actually injure the snake. But they, the important thing about this behavior right here is it's attracting the attention of the predator to the tail and away from the most more important end of the snake. But again, this flipping over is something that you'll see. And now it's a completely different looking animal, and the predator basically fixes on that. And just like the newts that we're going to talk about when I come back to um, they also are camouflaged on top and they have a bright underside. So they have the ability to say, whoa, remember, remember those things with the yellow belly? Anyway, it, it tends to protect ring neck snakes. And again, I, I've said these animals are beautiful. Uh, as a child, you might imagine my mother saw a lot of snakes. So she was <laughs> crazy about them, but she said, um, when you find a ring neck snake, put it on. She said, you have jewelry. So here's another snake, luckily relatively common around right here the California king snake. Um, a big, a powerful, constricting snake. Um, called the king because it is one of the snakes that eats a lot of other snakes, but it also eats a lot of everything. It eats lizards, it eats birds, birds, eggs, it eats lots of mammals, but they do eat other snakes. They are immune, I've read relatively immune to rattlesnake venom, and rattlesnakes, when they smell a king snake or even just a, a, a prop that you've sent to the king snake, they basically put their head front of the ground and sort of do the strange thing with their belly to make it a little less likely that the king's will be able to get around it and constrict it. Um, I have heard that they don't even attempt to bite the king snake. So uh, king snakes very often stay in areas where there are rattlesnakes and do feed on them, but they don't just feed on rattlesnakes, which is a lot of third and fourth graders get to believe. Um, they also produce musk. They invert their cloaca when they're captured, and even if you're handling them gently, and they produce blood from their cloaca. So you haven't hurt the snake, and the snake hasn't bitten you. If you start seeing blood on your hand when you've got a king snake, it's just one of the things that happens when the, the sensitive tissue of the cloaca is inverted to get more of that musk out. Um, so here's the, the first thing we're to now is the Northern Pacific rattlesnake. So that's our subspecies of, of the Western rattlesnake. And um, so the annual cycles of this animal. Um, well, the annual cycle of this animal. So here we have a juvenile, a juvenile rattlesnake, and the juveniles tend to um, be born really pretty late in the season. And quite often, you don't see the juveniles until the following spring. But they are specialists in feeding on lizards. So they tend to uh, be hunting in places where there are lizards. They often find lizards at night. But an interesting thing is, 
when they're first born, they have a type of venom that is more adapted to killing something like a lizard. It is a, a neurotoxic venom. It basically gets into the nervous system and pretty much stops the heart from beating and is a quick kill type venom. And then they swallow that prey and move on to the next one. But when they get bigger, they can start eating much bigger prey, like voles and gophers and mice. And the idea there is now they have, they have these big, long hypodermic fangs that can push this venom inside the animal. But there's an advantage not to be having to crawl around digesting an animal for a week and a half because it makes you sluggish and stuff like that. So what's happened is the snake has injected the venom into the system of the prey item, and the animal's heart is still beating, and so the venom is then passed all around the body. And the venom of the adults is actually a different chemical composition than the venom of the juveniles. It breaks down tissue. So the, the, the little mouse or the little gopher is actually being digested from the inside out and digested much more quickly than if it was just uh, killed and being digested in a typical way. Um, so I often like to say the last act of the heart of the prey item is on behalf of the predators, on behalf of the snake. Um, and a really quick thing about rattlesnakes is to, to, to really pass on, um, we'll talk about this in the deal, leave them alone. Uh, and I, mean, I am talking about that. Um, but rattlesnakes didn't evolve this incredibly potent venom and incredibly amazing delivery system um, uh, to defend themselves. They use it to defend themselves. It's, it's just subdued prey. It's basically, they would much rather get away from you than have to use the system that they have. Um, so they're, they're not like out there to bite you. They're out there to bite mice, and they want to get away from you uh, as way more than you want to get away from them, probably. Um, and the other picture that I have here is our, our mouse, like here's the juvenile with a very distinct pattern. Our adults tend to fade to this sort of greed. Um, some of the ones I've seen here are the almost charcoal black. So they're very different looking animals as adults. But they all continue to have this very patterned area near their battle. So to draw your attention to the thing that says, oh, don't make mess with that guy. Because a lot of times what you see is the battle disappearing. And if you're a bobcat, that tells you not, not to pounce on that particular snake. Question there. I've heard lots of times about rattlesnakes that the babies um, don't know how much to deliver or something, and uh, the baby bites from baby rattlesnakes are worse than about rattlesnakes. Does anybody else do that? Yeah, that I, I've heard that an awful lot too. Baby, baby rattlesnakes um, have a different kind of venom that is actually gram for gram way more toxic than that of adults. The idea that rattlesnakes control the amount of venom that they release is, there are different reasons for that, but generally speaking, a baby rattlesnake has a more toxic venom and delivers pretty much the same amount when it bites things, but um, that, that, that they, they can't control it is, is, is just an old husband's tale that just... <laughs> 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 anyway, so that, that's my power, I think. Can I have a couple more minutes? Yeah. All right, so this is an interesting, this is an important one, because people, some people are afraid of snakes, and you, know, you might often have kids, even young kids, where when you see a snake, some of them kind of freak out, you know, boys and girls. And it's really important to say that's not irrational behavior. Um, we are all here because our ancestors didn't get killed by snakes, right? So the genes to go like this when you see a snake get passed on, especially because humans evolved in an area where there are a lot of venomous snakes. And there are, we live in a place where there's only one venomous snake. But there's a lot of venomous snakes in the world. So generally speaking, unless you're really hungry and you know your stuff, stay away from snakes. And they've now done studies with human infants where we can put electrodes on their brain to detect uh, basically fear, to detect sort of the, that, that response right there. And indeed, when you're showing them images, when an image of any kind of snake comes up, those, those, those receptors light up. So it's innate. So it's not irrational to be afraid of snakes. It's basically something that we evolved with. That's why we're here. <laughs> Um, Sharp-tailed snakes are a relatively common snake. They're often found, like this is something over a board, finding a group of them. This is one of our snakes that can be active in the middle of the rainy season. They feed on slugs. Um, they're particularly well adapted to feeding on slugs. They are really pretty snakes, just to give you an idea of how small the young one is as they die. And they're gorgeous little animals. Gosh, I forgot. Rubber bullets, we don't see that many. And 
Uh, it's not a possibility. I didn't realize that Jimmy had this on your face. So night snakes are a relatively uncommon snake. They live up to their name. They come out at night and look for sleeping lizards. Um, there are records from near here of the California striped racer. So if you see something that looks like a garter snake, but the stripe isn't down the middle of the back, um, take a picture of it. Pick a part. We have cameras in our pockets now. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen western pond turtles in the water courses here, but this creek is very capable of, of, of having turtles. If you see any kind of turtle in the creek, try to take this picture and get it to Jeannie. Um, I think I actually made it almost in an hour that time. Anyway, I'm sorry if I went super fast and skipped over half of the picture. We have the rest of the afternoon for you to have a few questions, except when I'm getting them out.